Thank you very much, Caitlin. So we are moving right into, into the fifth and, and final session of the Responsible AI Forum preview. Um, allow me to welcome anyone who has just joined us. Uh, you know me, I, I'm a professor of business ethics at DUM and director of the Institute for Ethics in AI. Uh, I will moderate this last session and um, let me just say a, briefly a few words about uh, the general uh, topic. In order to support the effective and safe advancement of AI technologies that will benefit all parts of society, ethical concerns associated with the use of AI need to be adequately addressed. So IAI's inter, multi and transdisciplinary research approach seeks to identify these challenges, deliver practical and action oriented outcomes and develop tangible frameworks, methodologies and algorithmic tools in order to provide AI developers and practitioners with a set of ethical best practices and guidelines. What makes our research approach so distinctive is that we work in interdisciplinary pairs. We have uh, researchers from the technical side, so computer scientists, engineers, physicians, working together with researchers from ethics, social sciences, law, or maybe other humanities. This research approach uh, enables us to you know, comprehensively address uh, a growing group of ethical challenges arising at the interface of technology and human values. This session, uh, session five, aims to provide a glimpse into how the IAI is researching ethics and AI-enabled decision-making in practice. We want to illustrate how IAI's uh, projects engage with ethics and decision-making in key research areas, such as mobility and safety, future work, sustainability, and medicine and healthcare. So during this last session of the preview, we will discuss IAI's current research projects related to the topic with the researchers themselves. And with that, I would like to introduce you to our speakers and highly skilled researchers in alphabetical order. Um, Maximilian Geislinger is a PhD student at the TUM Department of Me Mechanical Engineering. Franziska Posler uh, is a PhD student at the TUM Chair for Business Ethics. And you can also, you can all switch on your, your cameras now. Um, both these are uh, research associates uh, on the Andre uh, project, which is one of our IAI projects on autonomous driving ethics research. Uh, Charlotte Haidt is a researcher at the TUM Department of Mechanical Engineering and one of the researchers on our project on human preference aware optimization systems. And then we have Minalini Kochupilai. Uh, she, uh, she has joined us as uh, the first of the 12 international guest professors at the newly established Future Lab uh, on AI for Earth observation. This is, this is led by uh, TUM in cooperation with the German Aerospace Center. And this lab focuses on the development of AI technologies for Earth observation, as the name says. The IAI participates in this research project, which brings 20 renowned uh, international organizations across nine countries and 27 highly ranked scientists at all levels together to address three fundamental challenges in EO specific uh, cutting edge AI research, and that is reasoning, uh, uncertainties, and finally, ethics. So we are glad to have you with us. And finally, we have uh, Lukas Meyer. He is a research associate at the TUM Chair of Medical Ethics and Health Technologies. Uh, he has been working um, uh, in, on the project method toward a method medical ethical advisor system for ethical decisions project. We will start with the short presentations from our panel members, and then we will try to answer as many as questions as possible. I want to remind you, the audience, that you can submit your questions or comments via the webinar Q&A function. So, uh, Maximilian and Francisca, you go first, I give you the floor. So thank you very much. My colleague Maximilian Geislinger and I will now share some insights from our research project on autonomous driving ethics. And first, I would like to start with a little history um, and uh, research steps that we have taken during our project. 
And uh, the question that was guiding our research in the beginning was how should autonomous vehicles behave in unavoidable accident situations? And um, in the past, this question was tried to be answered by referring to the famous trolley problem, as it is illustrated in the picture, which is basically a thought experiment or a situation where a trolley has gotten out of control and threatens to overrun five people that are lying on, on the track. And there's one option, and that option is to actively move a switch so that the trolley is redirected onto another track um, where only one person is lying. And the ethical question that arises in this situation is whether one person's death can be um, acceptable to save the life of five people. And um, there are various counter arguments. Um, one very obvious and uh, very prevalent counter argument for moving the switch and actively um, moving the switch is actually coming from the philosopher Kant um, and manifested in a law, um, namely the human rights, uh, but also the basic law of uh, Germany, um, which suggests that um, we are not allowed or we shouldn't uh, treat humans as means to an end or instruments and therefore we shouldn't sacrifice innocent or unevolved uh, individuals um, to save or in the, for the sake of other victims. And therefore we argue that we should stop foc focusing on these dilemma situations because they're not very helpful um, or sufficient in discussion in the discussion of autonomous driving ethics. And what we argue is that um, instead we should not make decisions about life and death, but we should implicitly decide who is put at more risk um, of potential sacrifice. And this is not only just in dilemma situations, but actually in mundane traffic scenarios. And to elaborate a bit further, um, you can have a look at the illustrations on the slide, um, where you can see an autonomous vehicle driving exactly between a truck and a cyclist. And um, the lateral position of the autonomous vehicle determines the risk it poses um, within this traffic scenario. And if you move the uh, autonomous vehicle further towards the cyclist, the risk would be shifted towards the cyclist because the estimated harm would be greater in the event of a potential collision. And then on the other hand, if you shift the, as we call it, ego, ego vehicle or autonomous vehicle towards the truck, the risk was, would be shifted away from the cyclist, but towards the ego um, vehicle. And therefore, um, our guiding research question um, within our project is how can a fair distribution of risk be realized in the trajectory planning of automated vehicles. And to answer um, these question or this question, we structured our project into the following working packages. We uh, first of all started off with a literature review just to gain a uh, comprehensive understanding of um, the state of research. And uh, then in the next step, on the technical side, we develop a motion planning framework that considers both the calculation, but also the distribution of risks. And then regarding the ethical side, um, here we aim to determine what is actually a fair or ethical distribution of risk, and also how would individuals um, distribute risk in real traffic scenarios or in traffic scenarios. And um, thereby, or therefore, we will conduct an experiment in the future, which is a little bit similar to the model machine experiment, uh, for those of you who are fam familiar with this. And then in our last um, working package, we would like to conduct an empirical evaluation um, of the upstream work ex uh, packages. And what we mean by this is that we would like to test and compare the uh, individual frameworks that we have um, developed until then in simulations of real and critical scenarios. And now I will hand over to my colleague Maximilian, who will share some early results of our research with you. So thank you, Francisca. As you've seen, our ultimate goal is it to include a fair assessment of risk into the trajectory planning of automated vehicles. Therefore, a first necessary step is to first quantify or calculate the risk of road users. And if we look 
into the literature, we find a definition of risk, which says it consists of two components or two dimensions here. So the first dimension is the probability at which an event may occur. And the second dimension of risk are the expected consequences out of that event. So we take this definition of risk for our domain of autonomous driving. And as a result, you see this simple equation, which says that risk is a product of collision probability and estimated harm out of that collision. And this simple equation enables us to assign a risk value to every traffic participant in a scenario. So there's a sim very simplified illustration here on the slide. And as you see, every road user, every vehicle, and also the cyclist is assigned a risk. And the special thing here now is that uh, this risk is dependent on the trajectory our ego vehicle is willing to take. So depending if we choose option A, B, or C, you see that we have a different distribution of risk here. So now let's move forward to the question, how can we possibly distribute risk? In literature, there are different principles known, and we investigated them and argued that some of them should be integrated. Our first um, insight here is that one distribution principle alone is not sufficient to, uh, for a fair assessment of risk. So let me, let me introduce you to the distribution principles that we found suitable. The first principle is utilitarianism. So we want to minimize the overall risk in a traffic situation or maximize the overall benefit. But another part of our distribution algorithm will be the principle of equality. And equality strives for equal distribution of risk among the road users. A third principle is called Maximin principle. And Maximin principle strives to minimize the greatest possible harm, no matter at which, at which probability. Fourthly, we want to consider working with thresholds. This means that a risk value must never exceed a predefined value. So this belongs to the questions of which risks are acceptable at autonomous driving. We as a society, which risks are we willing to take? And the last point is a question of responsibility. Imagine a vehicle is bringing more risk into traffic than a pedestrian. And we want to argue if we can consider this. So we can group our distribution principles in three groups. The first group are optimization-based principles. So the first three principles. And as you see in the mathematical formulation, they can be formulated as cost functions. And no worries, you don't have to uh, understand uh, formulations here. But just know that these are cost functions and can be considered in our algorithm. The second group are thresholds. They are some rule-based. And so here we can use some validity checks in our AI program, where when um, threshold is exceeded, maybe we have to um, execute some kind of emergency trajectory. And uh, the last point, responsibility will be subject of future research, because at this moment, we do not have a measure for responsibility yet and do not know how much responsibility uh, can be assigned to every road user. So finally, with this approach, we hope to move forward in bridging the gap from theoretical concepts to real software AI um, for autonomous vehicles. At this point, thank you for your presentation and looking forward to the discussion. Thank you very much. Um, so now we are switching to our second uh, presenter, Charlotte Haidt. Okay, um, thank you for the brief introduction before Professor Lütke. Um, I'm working at Professor Fotner's Chair for Materials Handling, Material Flow and Logistics in Mechanical Engineering Department. And our um, research partner from ethical side is Professor Büte, who is the head of the Chair for International Relations. And our research project is about a human preference aware optimization system, and I will give you a brief insight on the next slides. Um, as you probably all know, there is a rising technological pro 
progress in production and logistic area coming along with the industry 4.0. Um, there's a lot of number, um, high number of technologies and um, automation is rising. Probably you all know smart devices and variables, which are uh, omnipresent in logistics as well. And with this smart devices and um, variable, it's very easy for uh, companies to track the, the performance of workers and um, to increase the performance um, transparency of workers. But this leads, of course, to a performance pressure um, at the workplace for the individual workers. Another important factor is the increasing competitive um, pressure. Um, a lot of um, yeah, cost pressure um, is, is rising at the individual companies. And what the companies do is uh, they try to reduce the personal costs. So each manual process is looked in a very detailed way and manual processes are trying to be optimized again and again to save time and to save money. Um, both factors, they lead to a rising stress level during the working hours for our workers. And this can lead to a higher risk for diseases, but also implies loss of autonomy at the workplace. And at this point, our project wants to start and um, we want to bring the employees back to the center of the process design so that the people are happier and healthier and hopefully stay longer in, um, in a company to bring in their experience. Our research goals, um, the first one is how can we handle sensitive and personal data in AI models in a fair and transparent and also non-discriminative um, way. The second one is, of course, we want to involve the employees um, back to the processes and we want to investigate how can we how can we um, bring the preferences into um, an optimization system and to yeah to support the preferences of people. Um, and overall, we want to develop design guidelines and rules for optimization systems where we have those personal preferences um, inside. During the summer, we, we made some first expert interviews um, to get requirements for our human aware optimization system. Um, and I want to briefly um, give you an insight on those, on those requirements. Um, when we think of the process and the data in logistics, um, the process of course needs to um, be manual. So a worker should be inside and the activity the worker is doing should be um, repetitive so he's doing the same over and over again um, this is yeah um, combined with the with second point similar conditions in the processes um, we need to ensure comparability between the workplaces and between the work workers um, to optimize our process overall and of course when we're talking about data we need to ensure um, that we have data and we also need to ensure that this data is of high quality um, to use in, in our optimization methodology. When we talk about the optimization methodology, um, most of our experts said the most important thing is that we are transparent and fair. So the workers should understand um, what we are doing, what's happening with their data and um, yeah, what factors are influencing the results. Um, furthermore, we should allow statistical outliers, which means, um, for example, if you have a bad day and you're not performing so, so well, it's okay to have a bad day. And um, this should not rate you down um, in, your, in your result. It is okay, everyone has a bad day and we should respect this in our optimization methodology. And of course, overall, we want to increase our um, the well-being of our workers and of our working teams. And then, we, when we think of um, bringing such a system into into a company, we have to discuss or we have to talk about the corporate culture. Um, and one very important thing we have here in Germany is um, the Works Council. Um, so the work, Works Council he's representing the um, the, the, the workers and um, their opinions. And when we want to bring an optimization methodology with AI into a company, we need to involve the works council and we need to involve um, 
the workers themselves. And we can do this by talking about concerns of the workers and we should also talk about the expectations, not only the expectation, expectations from um, the management, but also from the workers, what do they think um, this optimization methodology um, brings as a positive result. And um, on my last slide, I um, brought some ethical aspects or some ethical thoughts um, we have so far in our um, decision-making AI and logistics. And as I mentioned before, the first one is we should definitely ensure transparency and fairness is one of the most important points um, for, for working with optimization. And um, coming along with this, we should avoid unintended system usage. So that manipulation or um, any misusage is um, not allowed or not possible. Um, of course, when we're talking about the personal data, there are legal boundaries that we have to respect and that we have to be compliant with. Um, and when we talk about data, that the data needs to be of a high quality to be um, that we can use them uh, at all in, in AI models. On the left side, our thoughts are more about um, uh, workers and um, First of all, we should allow temporary performance fluctuations, which I, which I mentioned before, having a bad day is okay. And um, we should also consider personal circumstances, like um, for example, if a worker is having problems at home, like getting divorced or having a sick person at home, we should uh, consider this. And we should also consider the, the physical conditions of individual workers. And overall, we, we don't want to have any competition between our employers, but we want to support the team thought and team building. And we, want, um, we don't want to have any discriminative competition between um, employees in our system. And um, yeah, that's um, the points from my side so far. Thank you very much for the attention. I'm looking forward to the discussion afterwards. Okay, thank you very much. So now I'm handing over to Mwinalini Pachipilai. Um, you have the floor. And may I uh, start with requesting all our participants to participate in a little online survey, just so I know who all are in the audience. Okay. So you need to just go to menti.com and use this code to It's eight one three eight seven nine two. Correct. Okay. Nice. Something clear blue emerges and <laughs> but much, much faster than in the US elections. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so the other bar is also inter increasing. Uh, so then if I think six people have not voted yet or five, but I will open up the next question then so that you can, we can have a word cloud where especially those who answered as other, if you would like to tell us your background a little bit. Okay, so there's a lot from business administration, philosophy and consulting that's coming out to be and AI. Okay, generally AI. That's good. Okay.
Okay, and then I will open the next question. I guess uh, this should be AI ethics now. So, sorry, I should have written about AI ethics. All right. All right, thank you. That helps me to know at what level I need to give my talk. So I would actually um, like to start with a question. And while you are mulling over this question, uh, I would like to show a little video. So this is actually um, an area of research that I'm just getting into, and it's about labeling. And uh, those of you who are in AI will, of course, immediately know the relevance of labels in AI decision-making. And um, what uh, also I would like to share with you is um, a little exercise that I did in the context of my research in the uh, future lab, just actually, we, we did this just before I came here, an hour before I came here, we had this presentation amongst the scientists who are working in this field. And um, I was asking them just like I asked you on menti.com some questions. And we noticed uh, that um, more than 75% of the scientists in the field have never attended even a workshop on ethics and also interestingly many of them feel that although there might be ethical issues in their area of research they are likely to arise at a later stage but those working in AI will probably confirm that data and then labeling of data actually happens pretty early in the research life cycle Am I right? And also uh, when asked, um, are there ethical issues in the broader field of research you are in? There was a nebulous, yes, a few, but also none that I know of. Yeah. So it was interesting that I then went on to ask them, uh, have you read the ethics guidelines for trustworthy AI? And uh, it was encouraging that uh, close to 50% said that they had. Also, um, it was encouraging that at least those who hadn't read uh, the ethics guidelines for trustworthy AI, they also had read some other ethics guidelines in the field of AI or earth observations, or at least within remote sensing. Now, for me, more interesting was are these guidelines practically useful for you for your everyday research? And here you can see where the problem starts coming up. And um, interestingly, I just, uh, while I was doing my literature review, came across a recent article that reviewed 22 AI ethics guidelines 
in the field of um, um, you know different aspects of AI, but attempting to create large scale or comprehensive guidelines for AI. And there was an experimental research done with people who did read these guidelines and those who didn't. And that research showed that the guidelines do not serve as a basis for ethical decision making. And primarily ethical considerations are mainly used for public relations purposes. And operationally, these guidelines are completely effectless. So um, it was fascinating for me uh, that uh, while we have all of these issues, as you can see, you know, their, their review highlighted that these 22 ethics guidelines identify all of these issues in the field of AI ethical issues. Uh, they find that 82% of these guidelines focus on privacy, fairness, accountability, explainability and robustness or safety, most of these issues can be addressed by technical solutions. And the guidelines primarily highlight those problems which are um, uh, accomplishable or overcomable by technical solutions. But there's a huge number of other issues that cannot be solved technically and need a different type of approach. Now, other uh, findings also from my own overview of many of these guidelines um, is, of course, you know, we know that ethics uh, cannot enforce themselves, unlike laws which have implementation mechanisms. And uh, often this just leads to a lot of discussion and no actual action uh, in public. Uh, there is, um, uh, the authors also made a very interesting comment that most of the authors of these guidelines are male. And uh, accordingly, then ethics of justice, this whole focus on technical solutions to ethical problems um, uh, in the literature, as opposed to a more comprehensive, well-rounded approach to resolving issues is very much lacking, what they call the ethics of care. With the exception of the guidelines from AI Now, I'm not familiar with this group, but they mentioned that this is an organization primarily led by women and they have um, a much more of a larger network of social and ecological dependencies and relationships based mm -hmm. approach to um, identifying AI uh, is um, ethics issues. So um, it's um, for also to go a little towards the specific area of research that I'm, since I spoke about labels to begin with, um, I wanted to show you one area that I'm focusing on with an academic uh, researcher who is an expert on uh, labeling and particularly labeling for identification of slum areas, you know? So if you see this, this image, there's four different resolution images and all of them can help you identify slum areas. But as soon as you identify or label an area as a slum, immediately there are issues of stigmatization. And when we talk about uh, labeling at this high level or large scale, we are not only talking about individual stigma, for example, that might come with mental health labels, uh, but really about stigmatizing a whole area of people. More problematic is when we start labeling areas for criminal activities. So AI labels are now used for crime detection or for even predictive purposes to determine where the next crime is most likely to occur. And this creates a pretty incredible vicious cycle of um, more law enforcement agencies being sent to those areas. Often these areas in the USA might be economically underprivileged African-American localities. And the more law enforcement in those regions means more crime detection in those regions. And this leads to a vicious cycle of deeper and deeper labeling. So the question that I'm dealing with now with uh, in the context of slums and also in the context of broader AI research is how do we create more responsible labeling on one hand? And second, how do we promote more of this ethics of care where ethical issues that go, go beyond technical solutions that cannot be resolved by technical solutions. How can we 
address them in ethics research. That's all to begin with, and I'm happy to take questions. Thank you very much for your great presentation. And uh, we have the final presentation by Lucas Mayer. Yeah. Yes, good, we see it. All right, hello, can you hear me okay? Yes. Perfect. Okay, now onto something a bit more practical, I'd say, an ethical advisor system for the clinic. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, that's the overview. Since it's only a very brief presentation, uh, I won't be able to go into, um, that was a bit too quick, one back, please. <laughs> um, I won't be able to go into too much technical detail, but well, let's see how far we get. Okay, the problem, I'll, I'll mention the problem uh, that we are trying to solve. Um, then the ethical foundation of the algorithm with which we try to solve the problem, how we train the algorithm, algorithm and I'll also present some preliminary results. Okay, now next slide, please. Okay, what's the problem that this project addresses? Clinical ethics committees have a lot to do. They get many cases they have to um, solve per day, uh, per, per year. Um, on the one hand, and on the other hand, there are ethical situations or ethically relevant situation in the clinic that demand um, decisions on, on, uh, on a very big scale and within short time frames. Uh, next slide, please. One of those situations the world has just witnessed uh, or is being witnessing at the moment, which is a uh, COVID crisis where scarce resources like ventilators have to be allocated uh, to a high number of people and this allocation takes time and it would be good if, if we could somehow use computers to help us with this task. Next slide please. Um, but even in you know in non-emergency situation it would be very beneficial if algorithms could help clinical uh, ethics committees in taking their decisions uh, what, what kind of decisions are these? Well, those are decisions at the beginning and the end of life. Shall we switch off patient X or shall we abort a baby? Um, it happens when, when people refuse beneficial treatment or when they request treatment that is actually non-beneficial uh, for them. It's about confidentiality issues. Shall we tell the husband of patient X about his conditions or is, is this uh, a private matter? and so forth. So those are the, the, the dilemmas that appear in the clinic. Uh, next. Okay, so what could be one solution? We could try to, to set up an algorithm that takes these decisions, or at least some of those decisions, maybe those are, which are not as complicated. And it'll certainly, certainly be more quickly uh, at taking those decisions. Whether it's also more accurate, that's a different question. Next. Okay, so the first question that appears might be familiar for those who've witnessed the other talk on autonomous driving, um, because it's unclear which, which ethical theory should underlie the algorithm, because there's just no consensus, not for countries, not worldwide, not in theory, not in practice, uh, whatever. So there are at least three big ethical frameworks. And this, this picture on the right is from the moral machine, which was mentioned already. And uh, this project conducted a big uh, survey, the Moral, the moral uh, Machine Project, about, I don't know, 2,000 people or so. Um, and this is a classical situation, situation. So should the car kill the passengers by driving into a wall or should, they, should the car kill the pedestrians? And depending on which, which theory you favor, which ethical theory, uh, you come to different conclusions. And most people said that they, they'd favor um, a theory that would protect most, so the majority of the people um, and reduce overall casualties. But for themselves, they'd obviously prefer a car that would protect themselves, so the driver. And you know, this is a problem that permeates every, every practical application of, of AI. Next, please. Now, in, in the clinic, we're in a slightly better situation because there's the factor consensus, at least, on which principles should guide the handling of patients. And I won't go into, into details here, but those are the four principles uh, that most doctors and clinical staff agree on. So benefit the patients, don't do harm uh, to the patients, respect his or her autonomy, and distribute health, health resources fairly. 
Thanks, please. Okay, so this is this is one problem problem we don't have to solve, which makes it much easier than yeah in the case of our fellow researchers uh, <laughs> who have to find an ethical theory guiding their autonomous driving at least. Uh, the the harder task comes later here. Um, how do we get the training data? And for our project, we used real life medical cases, uh, which can be found in case books, which can be found in records of um, clinical ethics committees. So the cases they've already passed judgment on. And the question is then how many different cases, case types do we include? And shall we, all, shall we include all four principles that I've just mentioned? And so far the principle of justice is, is a bit problematic, at least for us, because all countries or every country handles those things, things differently, right? Um, the healthcare systems differ widely uh, among countries and it's not that easy to, to find a common standard there. And some cases might also be excluded because they, they would skew the data set uh, into a certain direction and those are better left to human, uh, well, proper human ethics committees. Next, please. Okay, th this is, this is how, how a data set looks like for, for algorithm. This is the input data. So we built like 25 or so categories um, of parameters that the doctor would have to enter about his or her patient so that the algorithm uh, can assess the case. So the patient's autonomy, um, the expected benefit this uh, intervention is supposed to bring, the harm that it might bring about and so on and so forth. So that the algorithm um, gets a proper well-rounded picture of, of uh, the case. Next slide. Okay, so this is, this is uh, how the inner workings look like or what the inner workings look like of the algorithm. So it learns to, to attach different weights to different principles in different situations. It's a bit too complex, I suppose, to, to explain this in, within five minutes. But the idea is that um, the weights are not predetermined. So there's no principle that takes absolute priority, but the algorithm, algorithm has to find out itself um, which is the guiding principle in, in, in which individual case. Next, please. Let's take just one or two example cases. So here we have a 15 year old patient uh, who has been suffering from leukemia for the previous nine years. Um, she could gain an additional life here uh, if she continued chemo uh, chemotherapy therapy, but this would also reduce her quality of life. So often in, in, in medical cases, there's a trade-off between uh, the quality of life and the prolongation of, of uh, life itself. And in this case, the, uh, the patient, so the child, prioritizes life quality over the extension of life. So um, she wants to die at home peacefully and uh, wants to relinquish her chance for, for this additional year of life. And then the question is, should the intervention be attempted since, since the patient has not reached the age of majority? So is, is she competent enough to sort of end her life prematurely if she could, uh, could also get therapy? And to the right, you see uh, the output of the algorithm, what it looks like when, when it uh, yeah, considers this case. And you see that it changes over time. And the, the dotted line at point two is the ground truth we've entered. So this is what, what we as ethicists, ethicists think that, um, which would be the right decision here. And in this case, it works perfectly. So the algorithm uh, I don't think you can see my pointer, but the algorithm hits the hits the line perfectly. But it's not always the case. Um, but this is a particularly uh, well-functioning one. Next slide, please. So this is a different one, just just to present you with cases in which the algorithm sort of fights with itself. In this case, we have two decision makers. So the patient himself is unconscious, and his advance directive, which he has written, let's say five years ago, so says, "Do not do not resuscitate if I'm." In a bad state, uh, do not attempt to save my life. But the sur surrogate decision maker says, maybe the husband, uh, please resuscitate. This this directive is too old; it's not valid any longer. And so there's a fight going on inside the algorithm. Um, next slide, please. This is the performance. So just an, an early preview. So far, we have a deviation from our uh, humanly specified solution of. Point one, so that's pretty accurate so far. Um, 
but we have to see when we when we enter more difficult cases, maybe the, the deviation will increase. But so far it's it's working pretty well actually. Thanks. Okay, what is there left to do? We have to create a user interface. And in this, we have to strike a balance between user friendliness and accuracy. So how much data um, or how detailed can the data you enter be um, as opposed to, well, how many clicks do you have to do? How many things do you have to enter? So how user friendly is this, this algorithm? Obviously it should be as user friendly as possible so that it, it, it would be a decent replacement for ethics committees in yeah, in, in uh, easier cases at least. Then we have to evaluate the, the performance using new cases. So cases which are not included in, in the data set so far and might also ask different ethicists to specify what their preferred solution would be and see if the algorithm is able to meet those as well. And finally, we want to test this thing in, in the clinical or in the clinic, clinical practice. Uh, next or final slide. Okay, and obviously this was um, a collaboration uh, of different people and two chairs, so the chairs of computer engineering and our Institute of History and Ethics in Medicine here at the Jung. Thank you. Great, thank you very much. I think uh, our audience now uh, has had a very good overview of, of some of the research projects and what we are what we are doing there in detail. So it's great work that you all are doing. Thank you very much. Um, we have some questions, but before coming to the Q&A uh, from the audience, uh, I, I would have some, um, I would have some um, general questions to, to you, uh, maybe starting uh, with the autonomous driving project. Um, since this is this is an area that I'm quite quite familiar with, um, and my uh, my question is actually how do you see um, what are the companies doing? I mean, there's there's a lot going on, and there are also um, I mean in, in a positive and as well as in a negative sense. Uh, we have heard recently that. Uh, Daimler is going to back out of autonomous driving. That is their official policy um, as announced by the CEO a couple of days ago uh, by BMW. There has been an announcement which was not exactly the same, but also indicated something to in, in that direction. Uh, on the other hand, we still see that they are doing some efforts on the, for, uh, continuing doing efforts on the lower levels of autonomous driving. How, how do you see uh, what are companies going to uh, more or, or less in the near future? Say something about so, that. Uh, yeah, thanks for that question. So first of all, what we saw during our study is that there was a time um, when this question of who to sacrifice in case of an accident was pretty much present. And uh, some companies also told, yeah, we will always save our passengers. Um, so that was also a point where we thought we should start our research because this cannot be considered as fair. Um, right now, as you said, also in, in, in Germany, um, especially um, companies are not focusing on, on level four anymore. Level four is the level where um, the algorithm is not in charge of, of uh, the driving task, but we, you always have a human driver uh, in it. And yeah, so these, these ethical considerations does have somehow moved to the background. But on the other hand, if we uh, look to, to the United States, for example, we have Tesla there who developed a, a level two plus officially um, driving assistant, but which is used as a level four assistant then we see that we have the ethical problems right there. We have accidents there, people die over there, so they're, they're much present. But um, yeah, we have the two sides in the companies right now. And also um, what you already mentioned that um, some companies are starting to think a little bit of more about ethics and how to integrate it into autonomous driving. And um, one example which you mentioned, I think already is that being um, w, for example, uh, referred to the um, high-level expert uh, group and the trustworthy AI guidelines as um, something they want to rely on in the future. Um, so I think there's some efforts that are going forward in, in the endeavor of um, autonomous driving ethics also on the company side. Um, but also what we heard in, in an earlier talk was that 
the um, ethic guidelines seem to somehow be um, unaffected or not effective in some situations. And therefore, I think it is important for us researchers, but also policymakers, etc., to make guidelines that are more concrete and uh, are not very high level. And this is what Professor Lütke already mentioned to, at uh, today's session at 10 a.m. about, for example, the AI for People Automotive Committee, who will um, actually publish more concrete recommendations for policymakers and also for industry. So what they have in the end is a kind of checklist um, which they can regard in day, um, during the, their value chain. And we hope to um, have some more companies reading our work then in the future and integrating ethics. Yeah, I think this makes it clear that, I mean, two things maybe, uh, that there is, a, there is exactly this demand for more concrete um, solutions. Um, there is a demand for, for something beyond the high level abstract principles as was indicated by several speakers. Um, and, and also what actually there's an interesting con connection to the, um, to the, uh, the presentation that uh, Dr. Kochupilai made, uh, because it was a question of labeling. Um, how do you label uh, the, the systems that you have? Uh, you so we have this, uh, these five levels of autonomous driving. And uh, is it, is it uh, how, how do you level, label it as a, label, a level three, for example, and, and that means certain things? Or do you just uh, say, well, officially, this is a two level two car, as, as Tesla uh, is still says, uh, but it can do a lot of things more, um, actually. And, and uh, in, in reality, um, I mean, this is the question certainly of the legal framework. Uh, I think there we will need to see some revisions and, and uh, updates in, in, German, in, in Europe in general. And uh, the US is actually ahead of us here. Uh, okay, but uh, we need to move to the second. I have a question, another question to Charlotte Hyde. Um, since this is a very uh, interesting and, and um, highly uh, relevant uh, topic uh, for, for the future, and so I think some, uh, a topic where we already now see, see some of the AI systems being, being implemented. Um, at one point, you said uh, that you don't want to have competition within within uh, the the company or within teams. Uh, I, could you elaborate a bit more on that? Because some, I mean, there is also um, in in the management literature, you also see sometimes a case being made for for in in intra uh, um, competition in in teams or within a department, which might have some function. Is that something we won't see in the future anymore? <laughs> um, yeah, thank you so much for this um, question. Um, what I think uh, so far on competition um, between workers is that, um, of course, it can be helpful to have competition between workers, but we don't want to have um, like an increasing competition pressure so that you go to work and um, you have the feeling, oh, today I have to be better than my colleagues and I have to be that you have this um, pressure when you're when you're going to work, but um, I think what can be very helpful is um, increase competition between teams. Um, this is also what I experienced from my um, uh, yeah from my work at the industry that it's um, yeah kind of um, when, when teams are competing, um, you you get an overall uh, better um, efficiency and overall better performance, which could be helpful in, in our cases. But we don't want to have this um, performance, pressure, performance pressure for individual workers, which could be um, possible when we, when we make competition in between intra teams. Mm -hmm. OK. Um, for, uh... Yes, Nalini, uh, I had a, a question uh, for you as well, uh, since uh, I think this is a very interesting um, issue that you brought up, which has not been brought up so much before, uh, the question of, of uh, diversity and, and gender diversity in, in, this, in this field. I mean, there are, I know that there are some researchers who say that Men are under men are overrepresented, and uh, the AI Now Institute actually is, is really um, 
maybe an exception here. I, I just had a look at the AI for People group, which is one of those, and uh, we are, and I'm a member of that, we were 13 um, writing the original uh, paper and five of them were women. So, so I think we did, we did better than, than some others, but um, uh, would you see that there is a systematic um, influence on, on AI ethics principles, which would be interesting since diversity is certainly an important topic here. Yeah, um, you know, I, I, I can only quote from the study that I uh, was quoting from because I have personally not done any research on the impact of the gender diversity or its lack on uh, AI decision making. But one thing uh, and, and the study I was quoting uh, seemed to suggest that where there are more women in the panels, there is more of an emphasis on holistic pictures. Because you know, uh, AI systems will always only be as ethical as the people who are designing them, and uh, if we are focusing so much on um, you know solutions or technical solutions, then we might miss the bigger picture. And this bigger picture is sometimes um, a concept that can be brought in by, if not a woman, then at least a more feminine or caring way of looking at things. And here, one of the issues, one of the approaches we are considering uh, recommending when it comes to labeling of areas, whether it be for labeling slum areas with uh, when you're doing um, urban mapping using earth observation data, or if you are using um, maps to identify areas where there is more criminal activity, to turn around the labeling process to more affirmative action oriented or supporting labeling as opposed to um, you know preventive labeling or um, you know stigmatizing labeling so in areas which are currently labeled as slums if we were to consider that they are slums for a reason that means they are economically deprived or they're living in very bad living conditions then to call through that labeling for a uh, specific action that requires governments to take affirmative actions in those areas to improve or give more economic funding so that the stigmatized st stigmatization effect is not there, but rather, you know, people are happy to get more economic support. Or in criminal areas, again, to understand uh, that, okay, if this area has more crime, then possibly you need more education efforts here. So it's about turning around the labeling approaches to more constructive labeling. And this requires more of a care ethics approach rather than just a technical solution approach to how do I make the area which is labeled as slum more precise or how do I make the criminal area more precise? It's more a technical solution as opposed to a holistic approach. Yeah, I agree. I think that that's very important to see that the, the technical approach will not solve this problem and, and, and many other problems as uh, of AI likewise. I, I think this is this is something that that uh, already companies and other organizations are realizing and, and realizing that they, they need these other uh, competencies in their in their development teams. Um, by the way, I, I wanted to uh, highlight again that, as was said in in, in the beginning of our last session, actually, uh, that uh, we as the Global AI Ethics Consortium have now um, members from all six uh, continents actually in, in, in this consortium. So I think th this is very important to have. Uh, uh, um, so in terms of, of um, the diversity around the wor world. So otherwise you do not get the full picture and you do not get so many uh, valuable contributions actually. Yeah, um, so we have, uh, so one more question to Lucas Meyer. And here I pick up uh, one of the questions that was used in the, in the chat already. Um, so here there is a question as uh, someone did not fully understand the last part of your talk and asked you to elaborate a bit on what the relationship between clinician, clinicians decision and ethicist solutions uh, is for example in the first child end of life care case and and included uh, the uh, and in, that uh, he includes the question how can algorithms help here okay so ethicists versus um, clinicians. Well, normally um, treatment decisions are taken by doctors and, and still the doctor um, bears full responsibility for, for the decisions. Um, but in, you know, in, in very complex cases or in, in, in cases that are, in cases where there are parties that, that disagree, 
then they can call in the clinical ethics committee um, to to give advice. And yeah, this this committee is the is um, is the place where the algorithm should replace at least well some decisions, right? So not on 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 the level of the physicians or doctors, but on the level of the committee. Still, the doctor even even in the normal clinic, the doctor is still the, the person who makes the final decision, but uh, he or she gets recommendations if if needed from from the clinical ethics committee and these committees are staffed with um, um, jurisprudence doctors nurses um, philosophers chaplains sometimes so they they combine uh, their expertise from different disciplines to help with those decisions and this expertise can then be um, sought after by doctors or um, yeah, clinical staff or family members of, of the patient. And this is where the algorithm is supposed to help. Great, thank you very much. Um, is, there, um, is there another question? No, we, well, we have more questions in the chat, but uh, maybe first, um, since, since I, like, I like the topic of autonomous driving so much, uh, let me go back to that group um, and um, Here's, here's another question uh, for you. Um, do you think uh, those problems that you sketched, the ethical problems, which are not the trolley problems, not the, well, they are, they are not the main problems that will be uh, relevant in, in the everyday uh, practice, um, but uh, rather other questions of, of risk uh, management and, and risk weighing. Uh, is that something that uh, could be solved only by regulation uh, or could they be solved by, uh, by uh, ethical guidelines on the companies themselves? And um, I'm not saying that there is an either or. Uh, I think this is a misunderstanding uh, of, of much of AI ethics and governance that is either companies are fully on their own and develop their self-regulation, uh, or uh, we have a top-down regulation coming from the government. I, I do not believe this is, this is uh, a good picture to, to put it. It's, it can be somewhere in between. Uh, but here, again, these, these questions that you mentioned of, of risk weighing, is that something that companies could solve if there is no regulation, since we are waiting for that regulation also for, for a long time already? So, as I said, there are no regulations at the moment and companies don't have any incentive to think about this topic right now from a from economic or governmental or uh, law perspective. So, um, talking about the question of risk, we also thought about right now we are developing our ethical risk aware algorithm. And now the next step would be how can we ensure that this algorithm will be used or um, and what we thought about is we cannot force companies to use our algorithms or our equations that you saw here. But one thing that we thought about is if we look at the area of safety assessment of autonomous driving right now, there, there is an area of scenario-based safety assessment. This means that in order to drive on the roads, you have to show in some cases, in some scenarios, that your autonomous vehicle behaves the way that it should. And maybe this could be also a way for us at the end to find some specific scenarios where we can showcase that we have that desired behavior here or not. And this could be a way to, to derive some regulations out of our work. But our first step right now is to first get, get the idea of what an ethical algorithm consists of. And then at the next steps, how can we formulate this as something where uh, car manufacturers or company have to include it. And then what could be possible uh, external, like maybe oversight mechanisms, for example, if there are no regulations in place that, um, for example, from our results, the recommendations that we make, that then companies uh, need to make some sort of conformity uh, assessments or external audits to show that they um, comply with, with what has been suggested and what is ethical in that sense. I would like to pass uh, this or um, slightly translated question on to others, uh, maybe to Nalini. How, how do you see the, the relation between 
AI regulation and AI ethics in, in, in your work? Um, is there something that you can say, well, in, from a general point of view, do we need um, more regulation? Do we need regulation first? Because that's always, that's always a question here. Uh, in many areas, uh, historically, many areas of technology uh, regulation, it took us a while to arrive at, at those, at the, at the right rules, at the adequate rules. Um, but here, uh, many are calling for, for very fast regulation, although we might not yet have all the information about the systems we have. So how do you see that? Uh, thanks, Christoph. Actually, um, I view it a little bit differently because um, regulation is, in my experience, a double-edged sword, especially when we're talking about emerging technologies. Uh, it's at one level, of course, it has maybe more, um, uh, what do we say, uh, more teeth than a, a simple ethical guideline in terms of implementation power. But on the other hand, because, just because it's an emerging technology and we don't know where it can go, what all it can accomplish for the benefit of humanity, too much regulation will just um, uh, stymie the development of the technology itself in beneficial areas. So when we are talking about emerging technologies, I think ethical guidelines are, and particularly as you're saying, you know, more specific ethical guidelines, more concrete, usable, user-friendly ethical guidelines, which can be really used by people who think in a technical way rather than you know, an abstract way, those are hugely more beneficial than, than uh, hardcore re regulations, which then you will anyway have to spend a lot of money in continuously amending to keep, uh, keep pace with the technological developments. Yeah, yeah, I, I agree with that. Um, um, we have another uh, question in the chat directed to Lucas Meyer again. You use the concept of principalism. Um, how do you reason the decision for this kind of bioethical concepts? And what about concepts of deductivism and casuistry uh, or other concepts like Daniels, G. Worth's feministic or narrative concepts? Can, can you say something about that? Yeah, thank you, I can. Um, well, I, I'd say this is not my decision, so <laughs> it's not my place to, um, well, to say this is, you know, this moral system is, is better than another. It's only that uh, there's a de facto consensus uh, among clinical ethicists on, on, on those four principles, which, which has uh, emerged um, over the past 30 to 40 years or so. So obviously all of these approaches have, have their merits um, and all of these approaches have, have their problems like the, um, the four principle approach that, that you're focusing on has the problem, for example, that there's no um, meta principle uh, which can be used to um, solve conflicts between those principles. And sin since all principles are supposed to be of equal weight, this is obviously not easy. So this is one problem. The other problem is that, or another problem is that the principle of justice could be understood in, in, in different ways. So by no means is, is the four principle approach um, the perfect way of, of doing ethics. It's just that um, there is a certain consensus in, in the literature among ethicists to go with those, uh, as in German, uh, we say Prinzipien mittlerer Reichweite. So it, uh, instead of, you know, um, going to the roots of ethical conflicts with every single, for every single clinical case you have to pass judgment on. Um, the idea is to, to uh, use our moral intuitions, which are sort of entrenched in those four principles to, to answer those, those cases. And I think the consensus among, among doctors, ethicists, clinical staff is um, strong enough uh, for basing an, an algorithm on it. So there's none of the none of the other contestants uh, contestors is gets even close to to uh, the approval rate of, of the four principles. Okay, here's a question to Charlotte Haidt. Uh, have you already talked to the workers who will be the subjects of your system? Uh, do you know if they also consider this as an improvement? Yeah, thank you. I'm um, happy that this question came because I think this is. Uh, one of the most important points here, um, honestly, we did not talk to the um, to the workers so far, but uh, it's probably because of uh, some Corona issues. Um, we should definitely do this um, because when I think of a production area, um, it's very hard to implement um, AI systems and there's a lot of skepsis um, between the workers. 
uh, towards such AI models or AI systems. Um, and we, as uh, research researchers, we should, yeah, like lower those entry barriers for um, for the workers to understand what is AI. And this is uh, very difficult, I think, because um, AI is such a complex um, topic and um, we mostly have not so much educated um, people in the production areas and to, and to, to, yeah, to bridge the gap between this lower education and a complex AI system um, and to bring AI in a trans transparent, easy way to the workers. Um, this will be, uh, I think, one of the most important challenges in, in our research project. Yeah, this brings us to the question of AI literacy. Is, is that something uh, we, will, we will need? I mean, uh, it, it depends certainly on the application area and, and, and on the question who is, is go going to be the one who, uh, who is addressed actually and, and who will actually use the system. But um, I mean, this, this leads us to one of the main principles of AI ethics, uh, which is in there in, in many of the, of the um, principles that have, we have seen um, around the world in the last two years. This is explainability um, and or explicability as it's sometimes called. And um, uh, I, I would like to ask any of you who, who, are, uh, who ever wants to go first, how do you see the role of, of explainability or explicability in, in your domain? Who would like to say something about that? Anyone? Well, yeah. I go first then. Okay. Um, yeah, I mean, in, in, in the field of, of clinical ethics, it, explainability is, is uh, as important as it is in other fields. So when you, when you have uh, an ethics committee, which is staffed by proper humans, obviously they, they um, write the protocols and they document how they reach their decisions, right? And from, from an algorithm, you, you'd uh, expect that it does sort of the same thing so that you can, you know, that you can trace back whatever decision it makes to um, the factors that, that influenced it. And, and I mean, there might be court cases, the relatives might want to know why, why does this you know, AI suggest that grandpa is switch off now. So, <laughs> so it's, it's really important to, to, to have an algorithm that is accountable and transparent. transparent and um, yeah, like in, like in any other domain, if, if not more in the clinic. Yeah. Just was one one question about that. Is that both ex post as as well as ex ante? Uh, because that's quite interesting to see how this explainability turns out. In the clinic, you mean? Yeah. Um, if possible, yeah. That that would be that would be great if that if that were possible. I mean, it also depends on 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 the inner workings of the algorithm. Obviously, if yeah. you have neural networks, uh, explainability will be very low, as will be trans transparency. Right. So, right. Um, but yeah, if possible obviously bi-directional. And are you aware of people working on explainability AI or X AI it's often called in, in that field? Not specifically. I mean, we're trying to, to, to incorporate it in, in, in our project or to, to honor it rather. I mean, it's, yeah. it's a by, byproduct, but I think there's nobody <laughs> buddy working on that, that issue in particular. Mm -hmm because we have in, in one of our other groups, which was uh, presented in, in, uh, in one of the sessions yesterday, we have people at uh, the chair of uh, Jens Großklags, for example, working on an explainable AI in, in particular. And, and of, I guess that, that would also have some, some implications for other areas. Okay, anyone else who would like to say something about this? Yeah, sure. Um, in, in our area of autonomous driving, we also experienced the problem uh, of explainability as, as being there for sure. Um, if we take a look, we, we have bottom-up and top-down approaches. Bottom-up means I have some kind of database approach where I have a neural network that learns some behavior. And those are very, very hard to explain them. And I want to emphasize that this is not only an ethical problem, for sure it is, but at the moment it is also a technical problem. Because if we use algorithms that we cannot explain, this also means we cannot ensure that their behavior will be, will be right in a technical sense. So imagine um, your neural network in an autonomous driving algorithm outputs some, some, some random stuff and, and creates an accident 
So this is also a technical issue, but for sure also an ethical one. And that's why we were focusing on, on top-down approaches to run not into these technical issues here. So that's why we think it's important to find principles top-down, keep the explainability, and what's also important for us are these, these weighting factors. We are looking for them between these principles, um, but this is also um, transparent to other road users if we say, okay, this principle of utilitarianism is more weighted than the other principle of equality. For just, just to give an example, we're not uh, there yet that we can uh, make some, make some uh, assumptions, but um, just to give an example here. And um, this is like during the programming uh, phase, but also during the operation then of uh, the autonomous vehicle, there surely um, should be, and I mean in the um, normal vehicles that we see on the street, uh, streets now, there are also there are logging mechanisms or black boxes included um, or integrated into, into the autonomous or into the vehicle. And this should surely um, be also in the autonomous vehicles um, so that in retrospect, you know, for example, what were the underlying reasons for an accident and things like these. And um, I think some uh, organizations are already uh, working on like standards that uh, include these like minimal um, data um, elements or element sets that should be recorded during the operation to make um, more visible, more transparent and explainable what happened and how um, the vehicle functions. If I uh, can give yes. uh, another viewpoint on this, uh, you know, I think uh, whether or not explainability is demanded, if we look from the user end or from the other end, uh, it might be very much a cultural question because uh, maybe because I come from the East where we, uh, we don't believe only in logic, but there's a lot to do with intuition. And uh, when, if you've heard the story of the great mathematician, uh, Maha, uh, Ramanujam, he, uh, had, he developed volumes and volumes of mathematical formulae just on intuition. And when he reached uh, Trinity College and was asked to give proofs for those, uh, algorithms or, or those um, mathematical relations, he said, I just know they're right. And uh, we had Hardy at Trinity College then working with him to bring him down from that level of intuition to the level of logic uh, mm -hmm. to, ex to find proofs for his uh, uh, equations. And most of them turned out to be correct indeed. Uh, but I think when we are not talking about human uh, intuition, but computer-based logic, then logic, I think, should definitely be explainable. And uh, it might, however, take time uh, to reach that level of explainability. And uh, uh, until then, we, we have to go with some trial and error to allow for the technology to progress. I think that, that that might be a very interesting connection to make between the, the way we try to explain or make explain, ex explainable um, the results of AI systems with the this intuition-based uh, approach. Uh, I, I think there's, there's a lot of uh, potential for that, I, I would say, since um, eventually we might be, uh, is, Especially we, as saying as Westerners, uh, might might be uh, might have to uh, do with some approach that is not not so purely logic based. I think uh, that there is a there is a case for that to be made. Yeah, very interesting. Um, uh, okay. Uh, uh, Frau Heidt, wollten, would you like to say something also on this, to, or um, the question of explainability? <laughs> I mean, for us, it's also a very important topic, explainability. Um, I think we we are a bit um, like behind the autonomous driving and um, other um, other showcases. Um, for us, it's yeah more the, the transparency and fairness topic at the moment we are talking about and. We are trying to build our algorithm in a way that it is uh, transparent and explainable from the beginning. And uh, yeah, of course, it's an important topic also in our um, area as well. If we think of robotics, for example, 
um, but uh, yeah, we okay. can dis discuss another time, I think. <laughs> Thank you very much. So um, I, I just have one final question um, uh, for you all, because this is uh, about um, the way the Institute works and, and about how I think AI ethics should work in general. How do you, how, what is your experience with interdisciplinarity? Uh, how challenging is it uh, for you to work with people from different backgrounds? Uh, maybe just a brief, two or three uh, remarks will be sufficient. Who wants to go first? So um, I can start. Um, and so Maximilian and I are working together for one week, a year now already. And um, in the beginning, how we started our work was actually to um, collect all the issues that we find in the, the area of autonomous driving and auto autonomous driving ethics and ethics in general. And then we uh, met for uh, when we had identified all the problems that are in literature there, but also in, in practice. We met um, one entire day to discuss all the issues that we had identified and then make actually a cluster of um, those technical, uh, those issues that are, that are purely technically technical and those that are purely ethical. And then we try to find um, the overlap where we both can work on and we both can exchange ideas. And that was then in the end, the entry project. And I think um, we, of course, sometimes um, Maximilian has to um, elaborate on uh, some things that he explains uh, to me uh, in regard to technical um, functionalities and uh, vice versa when I talk about some ethical uh, issues. But um, overall, I think the mix is perfect um, because um, it makes the project more uh, practical than just theoretical. Okay, thank you. Anyone else? I can just um, agree on what uh, Francisca and Mark said. Um, I think it's a very enriching um, project and also uh, collaboration, just what I experienced so far. Um, it's very, yeah, very nice to get insights from um, the ethical perspective. And I'm also happy uh, when the project partner is interested in the techni technological questions and uh, how building how we build AI models. And yeah, I think it's a very enriching and um, very good uh, um, collaboration. Thank you. Um, a slightly different uh, perspective. Um, I don't think the issue is always only about the challenge there. I think if we want to do it, we all manage to do it with, with the effort required. But in my experience, uh, there also has to be an openness to it. So for example, uh, when, especially in the field that I am venturing into where technical solutions might not be possible, then to weigh in from insights, spray, say from psychology or for, from cognitive, cognitive behavioral therapy, where now a lot of research is being done on the impact of mindfulness training or transformative leadership training on ethical decision-making. Uh, there has to be openness among scientists to venture into those kind of areas of interdisciplinary research. And uh, I have faced a lot of uh, barriers on that front with people not even wanting to undertake that kind of multidisciplinary research. But otherwise, it's very enriching for sure. I agree with Charlotte. Okay. And Thank you very much for the open uh, openness. Anyone else want to comment on that? Um, yeah, okay, maybe just one sentence. I think um, cooperation is very important in this, in this field because um, ethics without practical application is futile more or less. And AI research without ethics is without guidance. Yes, I, I totally agree with that. This is a very nice uh, statement for, for closing. And uh, first, let me say thank you very much uh, to all of you for, for being here, for taking your time and, and uh, sitting with us here. Also, thank you very much for the audience. I think it, it has become clear that we, we can uh, uh, successfully uh, take this field on, uh, AI ethics, in an interdisciplinary way with interdisciplinary teams, uh, a combination of people with different skills and unique ways of tackling problems. So uh, this interdisciplinary way is, I think, uh, key uh, to making um, AI ethics work. And I'm very happy um, that, that we could also present this here on these, in this two-day 
event, uh, which is a kind of teaser, as you know, for our main event, which will take place in next June. And with that, I would like to close the um, Responsible AI Forum preview. And uh, again, thank you to, to all of you. Thank you to all who participated uh, in, in uh, discussing and in, in presenting. And again, thank you to, to, the, our to our team, to, to Caitlin Corrigan and to Elisabeth Weschenfelder and Anastasia Rizzi, uh, who made, uh, helped in making this all possible. And thank you very much again. And I hope to see many uh, and uh, all of you uh, and more uh, uh, in our main event in next June. Thank you very much.